Hello and welcome. I am Scrapperlock, and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server. We are with Quintessence Lass, our level 45 brute who has 19.5 million XP, nearly 3 million to go to get to level 46 in our next set of enhancement slots, and 50 million influence because I just sold some sort of a blaster archetype origin enhancement that I got from my uh, reward drops for 10 mil. And we're on a story arc from Maxwell Christopher, who says, This is my fault, Quintessence Lass. We've been used. Nemesis was only playing at being weak. He played on the Council's sense of superiority by allowing them to win the early rounds. And so, obviously, as I said, he has been kind of manipulating us. Fortunately, we still have some information he doesn't know about. Thanks to you, Nemesis' counterattacks fit a pattern hinted at in the research funding he's done to reverse engineer Vandal's robot designs and computer programming. I think Nemesis is planning to take over the Council's computer and robotic infrastructure and achieve a coup de tech. The result could be as bad as if the center had won. The first step to stopping him will be to prevent Nemesis from usurping the Council's computers. So we're going to go to Dark Astoria, which we have to go to Euroboros to get to. Um... Today is, I guess, the second day that Issue 1 has been live on the Rebirth server, and that includes the Guardian Archetype. So I did some digging to find out what it's all about, and it seems like the Guardian is this very weird hybridized archetype that has is both damage and sla defense slash control or support. Um, so the primary is a combo of ranged and melee damage attack, right? And the secondary is a combo of some defenses and some support powers, like debuffs and stuff. Um, don't know a lot of the details about any particular power set, but for example, um, they have like fire, and I think it's got a combo of like fire tank and brute melee moves like conflagration and stuff and maybe a little bit of fire blaster like flares i'm not exactly sure which powers they have because i haven't gone into character creation to look um, but it seems like a very strange kind of jack of all trades class to me um which might be something i would like i tend to like um classes that have lots of abilities rather than um being kind of mono abilities but uh, the other but they're often very difficult to get right when you're building them and i don't know what the developers of rebirth have done to um kind of set up the baseline of these archetypes and their power sets so it's something i'll have to take a look at at some point i'm obviously not going to do that right now because we're playing Quintessence last, but if you are interested in playing a character like that, the Guardian Archetype is apparently now live on the Rebirth servers. Server is just one. Um, so yeah, feel free to log in and try it out. Again, it's, it's free. You don't have to pay anything to play on the player-run City of Heroes servers, whether it's Homecoming or Rebirth or COXG or whatever Thunder Spy, whatever they whatever they're called, um, all of these are, as far as I know, open to the public for free. So feel free to try it um, if you want. So one thing we're going to have to keep an eye on in rooms that are large like this, we're going to need to keep an eye out for the Tyrolors or whatever they're called, the um, snipers. Because those guys can see you from all the way across the room. So far, we've just been fighting regular lieutenants and minions. So it has been a couple of days since I played on uh, Rebirth. Actually, since I played City of Heroes at all on uh, Saturday. Today's a Tuesday. I was getting ready for my D&D group, and um, that went really well. They managed to survive the Kuatoa Shrine and get out, and now they're talking about going back in because they survived okay, um, and they still haven't gotten the treasures that they were looking for. 
So um, they've kind of failed. I mean, they got out with their lives, and they didn't actually get very hurt, although they spent almost all of their spell slots. They managed to do a short rest, but they haven't managed to uh, complete a long rest. I wouldn't allow it, because it hadn't been um, at least 12 hours since the last one. And um, you're not supposed to do a long rest more than once every 24 hours. Um, and that is from start point to start point. So like if you start your long rest at 1 in the afternoon, you can't start another one until 1 in the afternoon tomorrow or thereabouts. I, I think as a GM, I wouldn't necessarily stop them if they tried to rest at you know 11.45 in the morning because it's close enough to 1 in the afternoon. But they finished their rest at like 9 a.m. And they got into a couple of fights and like at 11 a.m. they were like, can we do another long rest? And I was like, no, you can't do that. And then they got into fights inside the Kotoa Shrine, but it's still only been a couple of hours. So they took a short rest and recovered some things, but short rests in Dungeons and Dragons generally don't give you many, if any, spell slots back, depending on the character class. For Warlocks, they do... Um, my friend Sorcerer gets some sorcery points back. I think half of his sorcery points back. And he can turn those into spell slots. Um, and so that can help. Um, and so he's, I guess he's going to be able to do some extra fireballs or what have you compared to what he would have been able to do before the rest. But the Cleric's mostly out of spells and some of the other characters are out of their special abilities. So, um, and they're getting ready to fight a group of higher level Kuatoa who came down the hallway that they exited looking for them because they stayed in the front part of the cave to rest. And so I said, okay, the Kuatoa are going to take a short rest and then they're going to come looking for them. And they stayed an extra 10 minutes so that the one character could ritually resummon her. Uh, familiar who had been killed in one of the fireballs that the sorcerer threw. Um, he forgot her familiar was there and, you know, only has one hit point, so he killed it by accident. Um, and so um, they stayed an extra 10 minutes, and in that 10 minutes, the Kuatoa showed up. And we stopped there because uh, we'd had enough for the night. So the Kuatoa are going to fight them. And they, they've got some higher level guys. Again, I don't think, you know, they're, they're not generally that powerful but when you don't have a lot of spell slots left they kind of are now they might be able to fireball these guys i'm not really sure if that's what they're going to do um we'll just have to see and that guy is buffed which is a shame let's go ahead and take a two hit buff on him just to make it a little easier so we need seven computers my gosh this is going to be a huge base because we only found one so far um, so that was Saturday. I spent Saturday prepping for it and then running it. And then Sunday... I can't remember what I was doing Sunday. I was I was busy doing something and I can't remember what now. Um, I played some Iron Sworn. I've been like writing that, like sort of journaling it. And it's taking me a long time. I've done... I think that was my third session. I'd say it's probably been about three hours of play and I've like... I'm not even halfway through the first journey my character undertook. All she did the first, in the first session was make was swear her iron vow. And in the second session, they started a journey and they got like one, one progress through it. And she and the, she's helping an old friend of hers who's dying get back to his home. That's her first vow. And then uh, the second, um, the, the, the third session, which was the second session of the journey, I rolled a miss, and then I had to deal with the consequences of that miss. And, um, and it takes a while for me to come up with, like, what the Oracle means. You know, when the Oracle tells me that, um, like, it's... So it rolled a miss, and then you roll on the pay the price table, and it said um, that someone close to you is put in danger or harmed. I'm like, okay, well, she's traveling with a companion. I guess it would be the companion. And uh, so I rolled on the action and theme table, 
and it said bolster Val. I'm like, well, that's not a negative, right? It's supposed to be a negative. So somehow she's got to bolster her Iron Val. That should be a positive, not a negative. So then I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this? So I decided to have her friend um, who's sick and dying, like, become much sicker. And now she's got to, he's got to, like, lean on her. And so it's going to be harder for them to travel. And I don't know. There, I, I don't know. I, I'm still not sure how good I am at playing Iron Sworn. I feel like I have a lot of trouble making uh, sense out of what the Oracle should lead me to. Um, and I'm still not sure it's really the game for me. But I'm going to keep trying it. Um, I think it's it's kind of cool. I feel like it should be the game for me. I've made some house rules to make it the game for me. Um, that make it a little less frustrating to play, I think, or will, if I ever get, like, get into combat. Um, but, yeah, we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, I feel like I'm doing a lot of writing for very little gaming. And somebody yesterday on the uh, Iron Sworn Discord said, um, you know, when I do that, i.e. the writing, because several of us said we were doing that, he said it's cool and all, but then I feel like I'm writing and not playing a game. And I kind of felt like that, too. So I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, I mean, I could obviously always stop writing, but to me, I feel like if I don't write it down, it's not really permanent. You know, almost like it kind of didn't really happen. Um... I mean, the other option would be to record it. That's what somebody else said. Well, he just records it, like, on audio. But I tried doing that at one point. I recorded it not knowing whether I might maybe post it, but probably not. And even without posting it, I found that I didn't really like recording it. Because, again, I keep coming to oracles, and I'm not sure what to make, you know, bolster vow mean. And then i got to sit there and figure it out. And it might take me 10 minutes. And either I've got to pause the recording or there's just going to be dead air for 10 minutes. And, you know, I don't always know before I start thinking about it that it's going to take me so long to figure it out. And only after there's like a couple of minutes of nothing do I realize, oh, gee, I should pause it here. There's a whole alchemy to that that I just haven't really figured out. And so, I mean, I don't know. And, and then I'm always thinking sort of distractedly about dealing with the recording and when I should pause it and when I should unpause it and stuff like that instead of the game. And I don't feel like I have to do that with the writing because I'm not, there's nothing to pause. I'm not recording anything. And so, I don't know. I feel like I've been a little more comfortable with the writing, but I also feel like I've gotten very little accomplished if I can only do like a couple sessions a week and I can only do like a move or two a session it's going to take me months just to get through the first vow um, not that that's necessarily a terrible thing because there's no rush but um, but yeah I feel like I'm not sure yet whether I've got the balance on how I want to actually play it but anyway that's what I was doing on Sunday for part of the time um and then yesterday, Monday, I think I was working a little bit on... Oh, I know what I did. I updated the uh, the Foundry code, the Foundry server, because I hadn't updated anything for two weeks because we were in the middle of a battle, and I was afraid if I updated and restarted, um, the encounter tracker would get reset. And I had like 25 guys in the encounter tracker. Maybe more, 30, 35. I think we had a lot. It was a big battle. It took us most of the night. And here is the last computer. So yeah, I haven't... It's Tuesday, and I, I haven't played... I think played City of Heroes at all since... Um, since Friday. Which is pretty unusual for me. Um, but I just had a bunch of other things to do. And... Um, Sunday then I didn't want to play because I knew they were going to um, to be updating to the Guardian and they said it was going to take longer. I don't think it actually turned out to take that long, but I was sort of like, it's Sunday uh, and what I've kind of decided to do at a minimum to make sure I get some Iron Sworn done is Sundays is going to be like Iron Sworn day so that, because I know that they're rebooting this server uh, on Sundays and so instead of trying to get into it and 
not being able to connect and all that, I just say, screw it, I'll play Iron Sworn that day. Uh, I've been hoping to play more than once a week, but so far with Iron Sworn, I've actually only played about once a week. Um, so it's been interesting and fun, but, uh, but slow. And, I, and I'm still kind of on the fence about it. I gotta do it more. Um, okay, so now we gotta shut down computers here too. This is basically the same uh, idea as what we did in the last mission. As you can see, um, plus threes are no problem for this character, at least unless you're talking about elite bosses. And so speaking about adventures and uh, maybe talking about like GMing and how you go about it, um, it'd be interesting to, if anybody else watching is a GM, to think about how you would handle this. Um, the players were very concerned about having put themselves in a position to possibly get wiped. Now, as I said, I don't think that the guys they were fighting at the time could have wiped them. But I do think that if they stayed in the shrine and kept attacking, they would have been wiped because eventually they would have just been overwhelmed. Now, this one friend of mine persists in refusing to believe that there are hundreds of Kuotoa in the shrine. He just doesn't believe that I... I think he just doesn't believe I would have put that many soldiers. And I've said to him... I finally said to him when he expressed this after um, Saturday night, well, I don't know what to say to you to make you believe, um, but the gnomes who told you there were hundreds of guys in here did not lie to you. And he said, well, maybe there are hundreds, but I don't think they're all soldiers. Huh. There are. I mean, I did actually a, a token count. Um, somebody on the foundry, on the forge uh, discord told me how to do it. And after they'd killed about 30 guys, including the party, there were 303 tokens. If you take the party off, there were about like 295 Kuotoa left. I think about 100 of them, maybe 120 of them are pilgrims. The other like 160 remaining are soldiers. Now they're not powerful soldiers, but they are soldiers and they can fight and they have nets and spears. And if you fight 200 of them, they're going to kill you. And you eventually run out of fireballs and then they just get you with the weight of numbers. Um, but anyway, the Several of them were very concerned. Um, the one guy who doesn't play with us but saw the back and forth messaged me and said, if it comes to it, my character will sacrifice himself to protect everybody else. And so I said, okay. I didn't think it was going to be necessary, but I let the party know that. So my friend actually said, they were doing some stuff in email, and he said, you know, why don't we just do it in the Discord? I'm like, you guys can do it in the Discord. There, we have a Discord for my group. Nobody uses it. So he asked me to make a special channel and they could, you know, talk it out. And I was watching it and I wasn't paying super close attention because kind of whatever plan they come up with is the plan they come up with, right? I wasn't going to try to counter it. I just needed to um, play the Kuatoa. So I wasn't paying super close attention. And my friend, my best friend, who's got the sorcerer who can spontaneously cast, and this is another mistake of mine, I... I let him have a special ability. It was actually I who suggested it, so it was kind of my own fault. In fact, it is my own fault. Not no kind of about it. Um, he's, his complaint has always been that he just feels like the sorcerer doesn't get enough spells. And what he wanted to do was give himself a bunch of extra spells that just come with his subclass. The way, say, a light cleric just gets certain fire and light spells that come with their subclass. And I probably should have said yes to that. The main reason I wasn't in favor of it is because it seemed like he gave himself a bunch of wizard spells that aren't sorcerer spells just because he wanted more spells. And I feel like that's not where I wanted to go with it. So I said to him, why don't you just spend sorcery points to cast a spell you haven't prepped? And so he can do that now. It's called spontaneous casting. And... Um, so the problem with it is he can basically cast any sorcerer spell in the game that's of his level, and, or of the right level, and um, it it just makes there be so many possibilities to account for. And so, um, so he was talking about what spells to cast other than fireball, and he mentioned one that was hypnotic, 
oh gosh, what is it? Hypnotic something. And um, it's basically like a mass hypnosis. Um, forgive me, but I can't remember the name of the spell now. Hypnotic pattern, I think. And basically it, it puts up this kaleidoscopic pattern that you know mesmerizes everybody if they fail their save. And they have to basically stand there and stare at it. Um, and then he said, or I could do Insight Greed. Now, I'd never heard of Insight Greed, but I didn't, I just did clock it. I and mean, there was all this spam on the channel. I had, like, I, can go, I think I had gone to lunch. I came back. This is the day we were going to play, you know, but in the afternoon before we played. And um, I saw the, the words Insight Greed. I didn't register it. I didn't think about what that is. I'd never heard of it before, but I just... Like, it just didn't, I was busy doing other stuff, and I just didn't register it fully. So then they got into the game, and they started playing, and he measured out a template in Foundry and said, I'm going to do Insight Greed. And uh, what do we have, three more computers? Oh, we got to go south. And he then, like, posted the spell into the chat window. And I'm reading this going, what the hell? I've never seen this before. So I went and looked it up on D&D Beyond. Oh yeah, there it is. How have I never heard of this spell? Because I don't know every spell by heart in D&D, but m at least the spells in Player's Handbook, which are most of the standard spells in the game, I've, I've at least heard the name of them before. All of them. Because they're the same names as they've always had going back to the 1970s. And I've never heard of Insight Greed. Ever. But this is weird. So I'm reading it up, and okay, it, it, what it does is you hold up a gem of a certain value, and it makes it it basically hypnotizes everybody who can see it among your enemies within like a 30 foot radius, which was pretty much all of them, to stare at the gem and move toward the gem and and just um, worship the gem basically. <clears throat> and um, so I'm reading this, and I'm like, okay, and. He did it, and they all failed their saves because he empowered his spell to make it harder to save. Another ability I gave him I probably shouldn't have. Um, and this is a great example of, you know, an inexperienced DM, at least with 5th edition. I should never have allowed anything homebrew because I was in no position when they were first level to judge what was going to be overpowered or not. And although my friend said, look, if, if it turns out to be overpowered, we can always revisit it, but I know... He doesn't think it's overpowered, and if I tell him I think it's overpowered, it's going to be a big fight. And it would have been better to just say, use what's in the book. Anyway, um, he measured out the template, and I'm looking at this thing, and, um, you know, everybody failed their save. And um, I, I'm not sure if he had made the attack yet. But I, I, no, I think he hadn't. I'm reading it, and I read at the bottom, it's from Acquisitions Incorporated, which is a supplement that I don't own. Now, one of the other players has everything. The one who never shows up. And he shared it all with us. And I turned off, like, the modules, the adventures. But I didn't turn off the source books because I figured if somebody wants to use stuff from the source books in another game, they can at least read about it for free in my campaign. But I didn't intend to use things from, like, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, which is a world that's not mine, or the Mystic Odysseys of Theros, which is a world that's not mine. And certainly not Acquisitions Incorporated, which is another one of these TV shows like Critical Role. And um, so I'm reading this, and it's, it's Acquisitions Incorporated, and what I wanted to say at that point, we finished the mission, I thought we had more computers to find, but I guess not. Isn't there, I hear a glowy. Yeah. Right there. Shouldn't have ended until we clicked this glowy. Well, we'll do it. Okay. Alright, let's head out. I mean, we're early. I guess we can do one more mission. Let's contact Christopher and I'll continue my story. You did a quintessence last. Nemesis won't be able to make an easy takeover of the council now. Then he says, at the conclusion of this battle... Against the Council, Nemesis managed to capture Nosferatu, the mad doctor responsible for the Council's Corleonis. Wait. It looks like Nemesis knows you're ready to success against his plans. He's put an order out to make you a top target. I 
I'm not sure which one we're supposed to do here. One thing I know is that I have no intention of letting Nemesis get away with any of this, thanks to the document. So this has got to be the one. So this look, Because it said our rate of success against him, this looks like a street hunt, but it also, we've been successful against them, right? So he says, one thing I know is that I have no intention of letting Nemesis get away with any of this. I want you to go and capture Nosferatu. Now this guy could be tough. He might be an elite boss, but we've been doing so well that I think we're just going to go see if we can kick his butt, guys. So anyway, um, I saw this thing was Acquisitions Incorporated, and what I wanted to say was, there's no Acquisitions Incorporated, Eberron, Theros, Wildmount, any of those source books. There's none of that stuff in this game. If it's not in Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, Monster Manual, Xanathar's Guide, or Tasha's, we don't use it. However, as a GM... I didn't want to say that at the moment they were getting ready to execute the plan that they had made, which I had technically seen on the Discord, and hadn't said anything about. Right? To me, that felt too much like the GM stepping in. It would look like, as a GM, I was stepping in and trying to stop them from, from executing their plan. And I also didn't want to have an argument, which I know will happen when I tell my friend he can't use this spell anymore, I didn't want to have an argument in the middle of a big giant battle with like 30 guys. So I allowed it. And I didn't really say anything about it at that point. I hate the spell because what happened is then like they put up a wall of fire and half the guys affected by the spell couldn't see it. But the, based on the way the spell reads, they were still hypnotized by a gem they now couldn't see. And they still had to try to approach this guy. Now they couldn't come through the fire because it said they won't do anything to harm themselves right they will only approach safely so what we talked we talked about this and what we agreed was okay they'll try to come around another way meanwhile the sorcerer is moving all over the place it's like well how could they know where you are now i guess they're going to move to where you were but to me logically if i were going to allow this spell again which i'm almost certainly not going to I would rule that if you break line of sight, like if you put the gem in your pocket or something, that's the end of the spell. It's over. So one of the problems was the sorcerer had empowered the spell to make the DC, the difficulty, 19. And they had no bonuses to their wisdom saving throw, so they literally had a roll a 19 or a 20 on the 20-sided die to get out of it. Which one or two of them did because there were so many of them and they were rolling so often. Um, and I don't really mind that he, you know sort of effectively paralyzed the whole group. But, um, A, I think it's stupid that when they can't see the gem, they're still mesmerized by it. And B, I don't want stuff from Acquisitions Incorporated, not just this spell, but any of it in my game. So now what I'm going to have to do at the beginning of next session, and I'm going to do it at the beginning of the session in front of all the players, because if I do it to my best friend, he's going to just fight with me for two weeks. Um... I'm going to say, guys, you know, this happened last time and I saw it too late to do anything about it and I didn't want to disrupt your plans, so I let it happen. And I didn't want to mention it last time because I didn't want to get into a discussion about rules in the middle of a combat. But we aren't using stuff from the other source books, only the base stuff, right? So Acquisitions Incorporated, Eberron, Wildmount, all these other ones, you can't use stuff that's in those books. I've turned them off now in the content sharing, which I should have done before. But the first, the last time I looked at it, I'm not sure if you could. Right? I think you could tell it to include modules or not, like adventures, source books, or both. And I took the adventures away. But I, I don't think at the time, I, I don't know if at the time I could turn source books off individually. Now you can. But I'm not sure if you could originally. That's still my fault. I should have checked it. I should have made sure. And I should have realized when they were talking about it in the discord and said guys you can't use stuff from acquisitions incorporated before they made their plans dependent on it so i'm going to say look it happened once we're not going to retcon it or anything we'll just say the sorcerer managed to do it and just got lucky in the adrenaline surge but he can't remember how to do it again and please don't try to pick anything from these other source books anymore um and the reason i'm going to do it in the in the 
uh, session is because I'm fairly sure that at least two of the other players who have DM'd before will back me up. We'll see what happens. I know my best friend is going to complain about it, but I'm pretty sure because of the way the Cleric's player acts most of the time and stuff that he has said to me, um, he's going to say to my friend, uh, buddy, this is DM's prerogative. It's his world. If he says this, these things don't exist in his world, that's it. You don't, you don't get to argue about that. Um, I, my friend's argument is going to be, well, what did it hurt? Right? Well, what it hurts is if, if it's possible for Acquisitions Incorporated stuff to exist in my world, now I have to read through every freaking page of a book I don't even own or want to own and see which things I want to use and which things I don't. Just like I had to do when Tasha's Cauldron of Everything came out. I had to read that whole book and make notes and write down what are we using and what aren't we using. Right? And so now I have to do that for every source book. I'm not buying every source book. I don't want to read every source book. I don't care about the other source books. Right? We, don't, we know, for example, we don't have artificers, which are from Eberron in my world. I don't want to use Artificer stuff in my world. I don't want to use Chronomancers, which are Matt Mercer's class, or um, Blood Hunters, which are from his world. That stuff's not in my world, and I'm not going to go through every book and try to figure out what's in the world and what's not. I'm making a blanket ruling. None of it is. And you know, if he doesn't like it, I, it, I think this is one of the times he's going to just have to just lump it, as my mother would say, like it or lump it. But I'm not... I don't think I'm going to change. Um, and, and I'm really like at the point where if anybody says, look, I don't want to play the game if you're not going to let us um, you know, use stuff from a book you don't like, I would say, okay, who wants to GM? Because I'm, I'm not changing. Like I want the players to have fun, but I'm not going to add a bunch of stuff from, um, from a setting that I don't even care about or like. I mean, let's think about I don't know anything about really Acquisitions Incorporated, but it's called Acquisitions Incorporated. And the spell is called Incite Greed. Right? So this makes me think that there is something about that setting that has to do with greediness and business propositions and money and, you know, like um, that sort of thing, like a some sort of an economic type theme to it that is not appropriate for the game I'm running in the Roman Empire. It's not to say there weren't businesses in the Roman Empire, but we're not running it that way. And I'm not really interested in adding all this stuff to my game. And the other issue is the more that you add to your game, like the more variables than I as a game master have to account for. Like there is no way that I ever could have accounted for that spell because I didn't even know it existed. And there are going to be thousands of other things like that if we set the precedent that anything the players want to use from any book we're going to use. So I turned off all those other uh, sources and I guess we'll see what happens when I mention to everybody in the beginning of the session, okay, that worked last time. But we're not doing it anymore because it's from the wrong book. And I didn't realize it until it was too late. I didn't want to ruin your plans, but we're not doing that again. <clears throat> so they do they do know there's a, a group of guys coming. I'm hopeful he's not going to say in the Discord sometime this week or next, ooh, let's do this again, and they make plans around it because then... Then I'm going to have to mention it in the Discord, and it's going to just... I just feel like this is something we need to talk about verbally um, and not something I want to write about in email or in text on the Discord. So we'll see what happens. It's funny, I've been describing some of the things that my best friend's been doing at, to, to one of the other DMs on... Um, on D&D uh, &D Beyond, who I only know through D&D &D Beyond, but I've become quite friendly with. And he actually said to me, dude, I would not put up with this stuff from this guy. And, and he said, you better be careful because if your other players aren't pulling this kind of crap, it, you don't want it to, like, to look like you're playing favorites. And that's true, too. 
Um, I think I've managed to avoid that. But, um... And the cleric is definitely at least as powerful as a sorcerer, so... I don't feel like he's that overpowered. But, um... But yeah, what's really interesting is my friend, who's usually the first one to complain that things aren't challenging enough, was like, oh yeah, it felt great to unleash my character's powers finally, and really let loose. And I'm like, so this is what you want as an easy game where you just charm everybody you can see, and then they can't attack you? I mean, is, is that really what you want? I wouldn't, as a player. And speaking of that, you know, there was um, a relatively new DM. And I gotta say, for 5th edition, I'm relatively new too. And for high-level game play, I am absolutely new. We're, we're getting into waters which, for me, are uncharted. I've not done high-level game play, like, 7th, 8th, 10th level in D&D ever. And the characters these days are more powerful than they've ever been before at a given level. Far more powerful than they were when I played 1st edition. And I think more powerful even than 3rd edition, relative to the monsters, and what the monsters can do. And um, so we're, I'm kind of going into Uncharted Waters, and um, this other DM who's got characters of about this level was complaining that he's got a, a, a couple characters, and, and I do too. I have two characters, both of them can throw fireball. And now they can throw a lot of them, right? Um... I believe they threw five fireballs and the sorcerer... They threw six, I think. And now the sorcerer, after a short rest, can throw two more. Um, and the, now the, the cleric can't, because he hasn't long rested, but the sorcerer can. not And so what this other DM was saying is, yeah, they just open up every battle with twin fireballs at the top of the initiative. And, you know, for me, at least, both of these characters have high decks, so that means they've got a high initiative bonus. That means that more often than not, they're going to go before the enemies can even move. So they open up a door, they see like eight guys in a room, and they just throw in two fireballs, and the, the, you know, the eight guys are now down you know, 50, 60, 70 hit points, and either they're dead, or the battle is going to be over very quickly. And so this other GM was saying, you know, what do you do about that? Now, there are ways to get around it, but a lot of them are very artificial. Right, like setting up traps or that sort of thing. I mean, one of the things with the Kuatoa is because there were so many of them, yeah, they were fireballing the crap out of them and killing dozens at a time, but there were there are still a couple hundred more. Right? And so if they just stayed in there and tried to clean out the dungeon the old school way, they would have eventually been on no spells and then they would have had trouble. Right, so that's one way to handle it: is just send waves and waves of weak guys, who would die to spells much less powerful than fireball. I mean, it's basically overkill. And with a lot, and in several cases, even when they saved, right, taking half damage, they still died because they only have 18 hit points, and a fireball is five dice eight, five d eight, um, which on average does something like. What is it? 5.5 times 8 would be what? Uh, four, um, 11 for 2. Would it be 44? That sounds way too high. No, 5d8. So, something like 26. So, even half damage is going to drop them all to 5 hit points. Right? So, you throw two fireballs, they're all dead, even if they all saved. And a lot of them the dex save of plus zero are going to fail and they're going to get one-shotted. So um, so they're not strong, right? And these guys can blow them away, but, um, but there are a lot of them. Um, but if you have smaller populations, like I was thinking about um, when they go to Rome, I have like some cultists and there are some you know, sort of moderately powerful undead, right? That are, you know, four or five, like, powered-up zombies. They're called Spawn of... I can't remember what. I call them Spawn of Canidia because it's a Roman witch. Um, 
she was like a Roman warlock, basically, who served Orcus. And they were kind of like... Zombies are like level one creatures. They're kind of like fourth or fifth level zombies. And so I have like four or five of them in this room. And I realized, you know, well, probably they're going to just get fireballed. And die. You know, or, I don't know if they're going to die in one shot, but they're going to get fireballed and they're going to die pretty easily. Um, and they have all these cool features. Like they can send a little worm at you and it can like sort of possess you and start turning you undead. But that probably won't happen because they're all going to be killed by the fireball. And, you know, I'm thinking about, well, how do you prevent that? Well, the only way to do it is to spread them way out, right? And how many dungeons, especially this is in, like, under the sewers, how many areas under the sewers are going to be that big, right? I mean, you just, you just don't make rooms that gigantic. It's very rare that you see a room that big. And even if I do it for that encounter, I won't be able to do it for many of the other encounters. And so basically any room that's less than like 60 feet across, which is a lot of rooms, they're basically just going to fireball it. And that's pretty much what happened to this other DM. And I said, you know what? I don't know what I want to do about this. On the one hand, I think it's really stupid and annoying to just have everything be fireball. Um, on the other hand... And if that's what they want to do, I guess that's what they can do. You know, I don't want to hear it's too easy, right? If they're going in fireballing all the time. Um, I think if I really make sure that I enforce all of the rules about rest so that they can't do long rests very often, right? Then I think maybe they won't just fireball like crazy but I don't know I think that as they get to higher and higher level it's going to be fireball city right you could do you can do things like okay make the bad guys immune to fire but why would a bunch of kuatoa be immune to fire right now one type of enemy they're going to be fighting is slod if they ever get to that. Um, those guys, I think, have resistance to fire. And they have magical resistance in general, which gives them advantage on saving throws. <clears throat> so that will help them. And they have a lot more hit points, too, so they won't go down so fast. But... Um, and the green slot can do fireball right back to them. And they're invisible, or can go invisible. So I think with the slot eye, what I might do is, you know, like group up some red and blue ones and have a green one be standing there invisible nearby, uh, but outside the radius of what would be a fireball to the green and blues. And if the parties like lump together and they fireball the greens and the blues, the, or the reds and the blues, the green slot will come out and fireball them right back. I mean, I could do that. Um, but on the other hand, the one this one DM was saying, when he did that to the party, they were like on a boat, and they were seen by the enemy, and the enemy wizard on the boat fireballed them, and they were all in a boat, like a rowboat, so they all got hit. One of the players said, oh yeah, this is the DM getting revenge on us for doing all those fireballs to him. So, like, you can't win, right? I mean, if you do it back to them, it's considered DM's revenge, and it's not fair. If you stop them from doing it, it's not fair. But if you let them do it, they complain that it's too easy. So I'm not sure, you know, what you're supposed to do about that, to be honest. All the years I've GM'd, I don't know. Um, you know, ha dealing with multiple fireballs was never an issue when I DM'd before because we never got high enough level to throw multiple fireballs. <clears throat> the most you could do was maybe one. And I think, by the way, this the way this is playing shows the wisdom of Gary Gygax for saying you had to declare how many copies of a spell you were memorizing each day, right? You couldn't say, all right, I'm going to memorize Fireball, Lightning Bolt, and Acid Spray, and then 
I can use however many of them I have spell slots for. So you could memorize the three of them, but um, only throw three fireballs. Because you can throw three, you know, level three spells, and those are all level three spells. We're going to ignore the lieutenants until we take out the minions. Um, Gygax would have said if you want to throw three fireballs, you have to say at the time you take your long rest, I'm going to memorize fireball three times. And then you don't have the other spells open to you. So it would be suicide, unless you know exactly what's coming, to memorize three fireball and nothing else, because if you need something other than fireball, you're screwed. So most wizards, most magic users, and clerics would not memorize multiple copies of the same spell other than maybe cure light wounds. Instead, they would memorize one or two of e copies of each spell so they had access to multiple spells. And a lot of people don't like that because of the mechanics, but the advantage of doing it that way in terms of balance is this, a party in the original Shrine of the Kuatoa would not have walked in there with six fireballs memorized between two characters. They would have said, that's crazy. We need to make sure that we have all of our bases covered. You better get something else like Counterspell. And now I'm remembering, I think this guy kicked Tiger Strike's butt, didn't he? At this level, he's plus three to me. I bet I'm not going to be able to get him. I think I couldn't beat his regen. If that happens, I'm going to um, pause the video and we'll bring him back at plus zero. But let's try it. Let's see how we go. And of course he's got psionic, right? Because every elite boss has psionic powers. Yeah, I think I'm just not going to wear him down fast enough. But we'll see. Let's try to get rid of this minion, if I can, with the splash damage, as it's called because um, he's throwing gas at me and the AoE gas is going to just keep doing damage to me as the damage over time. Just try to get out of that. We're doing okay against him, actually. And one advantage of this character is she is debuffing his two-hit. I can't believe this. If this character does it, when um, Tiger Shrike couldn't, that says a lot for this character. Oh no, there he goes, he just healed himself. I don't know how many times he can do that. Let's get some endurance. See, I can do back to him what he does to me, and that helps. Uh, see, if he keeps healing like that, I can't. I just can't do enough damage to him. And he's not going to do anything to me. But I can't do enough damage to him. And eventually my inspirations are going to run out. Yep, we're not going to be able to beat him, I think. Especially if, uh, when I'm clicking on things, they don't actually work. Yeah, see, he healed himself again. And I'm at 275 damage, percent damage. Man, this is a long battle. We 
are wearing him down. Question is how much more is he gonna heal himself? Ah, missed him. And see, missing that heal is painful. Yep, he just healed 1,300. That's ridiculous. This is quite the battle, guys. Let's get some endurance. Let's go ahead and put our panic power on. See if that helps. I don't know if it will. Heal up. There we go. Come on, we got you. I think we got him. Don't heal up. Yes, we beat him at plus three, guys. That is not bad at all. So we defeated Nosferatu. Now our panic power is going to run out in a couple minutes, but we've got some time. We may as well take these guys out. So yeah, I, I'm not sure entirely the best way to approach this business of players using uber powers like they think it's so fun to be super powerful but then they'll often be unhappy when the battle isn't challenging and it's sort of like well if you're super powerful then that makes the battle not be challenging I mean that fight we just had with Nosferatu was challenging um, it wouldn't have been if he had been plus zero right or if we'd been way more powerful, or had way more inspirations, or more powerful inspirations, it would have been too easy. Right? That's how you do it. That's right. Nosferatu is in the zig. Now we just have to figure out what Nemesis wanted Nosferatu's expertise for. Well, we do have to figure that out, folks, but we will do that next time. Until then, I am Scrapperlock, and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server.